Hello everyone, this is uh, me, Apostate Imam, your favorite uh, ex-Muslim. And uh, today with me, I have Yasmin Muhammad. Uh, Yasmin Muhammad is an Arab-Canadian uh, university educator, activist, and an author. She's also a human rights ac activist, campaigner. Yasmin Muhammad advocates for the rights of women living in living within the Muslim majority countries as well as those who struggle under religious fundamentalism in general. She is the founder of Free Hearts, Free Mind, an organization that provides mental health support for members of uh, the LGBT community and free thinkers living within Muslim majority countries where both crimes can be punished by execution or by death penalty. Her book, uh, Unveiled, uh, is a memoir that recalls her experiences growing up in a fundamentalist Islamic household and her arranged marriage to a member of Al-Qaeda. In it, she sheds light uh, she shed light on religious trauma that so many women still today are unable to discuss. Yasmin Muhammad also worked with Ayan Hirsi Ali Foundation, and she's on the board directors for Human Rights Global Charity and for the Atheist uh, for Liberty uh, community as well. She's a member of uh, the prestigious uh, uh, Center for Inquiry, CFI. And uh, she has spoken uh, in Canadian par Parliament on M103 and Islamophobia. And uh, she has been featured in many mainstream media publications such as um, BBC, CNN, CBC, ABC Australia, Al Jazeera News, New York Times, uh, in Charlie Hebdo Magazine, Lee Point, Jerusalem Post, uh, Times of Israel various uh, different uh, mainstream media uh, publications uh, interviewed her and uh, she's uh, pretty popular so she don't need her any introduction so uh, let me uh, add our guest yasmin mohammed thanks for joining our stream thank you so much for having me i'm glad that we could finally do this yeah, I was waiting for such a long time. It means you were really busy, and uh, I was inviting you from, I guess, past four months. <laughs> so yeah. finally, I have you. So uh, tell us about your journey that how you left Islam, and how was your childhood, and how you escaped um, this cult? Okay. Um, so that's a really long story, but I'm going to try and make it as concise as possible. So I grew up in Canada and my parents divorced when I was about two years old. And then my mom remarried a man who, um, he was a fundamentalist Muslim. And so he got her to wear hijab and to start praying and to, force us to memorize Quran and suddenly we weren't allowed to have non-Muslim friends anymore. Um, we had to start going to Islamic school and she was his second wife. So in Islam, a man can have up to four wives. So she was wife number two. He already had wife number one who uh, was a convert to Islam. She's a Canadian convert. And she had with him, like they had four, three children and then my mom had three children and so she the first wife lived upstairs and the second wife my mother and us we lived downstairs we were the second class family and so going to islamic schools wearing hijab um no non-muslim friends it's like a mini sharia like a mini sharia in the middle of canada a sharia bubble and then 
when I was 19 years old, that's when they forced me to marry, as you mentioned, this terrorist. Um, and I had a daughter with him. When I married him, I had to wear niqab, which is the black covered head to toe in black, not even my eyes showing black gloves. And when I had my daughter, I felt like I need to do anything to get my daughter out of this life because I don't want her to live the same life that I lived. And um, like I mentioned, he was a terrorist. He's a member of Al Qaeda. And so the Canadian, like the Canadian CIA, they were watching him and they were after him. And um, he's in prison in Egypt now. But I was able to get myself and my daughter away from him, away from my family. And then we started our life over again. But of course, I was very scared because I didn't know, is he sending his Al Qaeda friends uh, to come get me and my daughter? Um, and also my mother threatened to kill me because she was so angry that I removed my hijab. I'm going over many years now. This is many, many I'm like, uh, my story now so far has like my entire life up until I'm like 22 now, 23. And um, so yeah, but when I was about 26, I started going to university. And um, that's when it all happened. So in university, I took a, a history of religions course which for the first time I was able to critically examine Islam, question it, talk about it. It, it. You know, if you grew up Muslim, that you're not supposed to question too much. When you question, it's the it's the devil whispering in your ear. It's waswasa. So you have to you have to try to shut down any kind of critical thinking and you just obey, obey, obey. And so when I was in this history of religions course, it was the first time that I was allowed to talk about this religion. And of course, once you start to critically examine it, it doesn't take long before you start to realize, oh my gosh, this is just, none of this makes sense. And at the same time, also 9-11 happened. And so I was bombarded both intellectually from this course that I was taking and then emotionally from the, you know, the aftermath of 9-11 with the thousands of people that had been killed. And then, of course, the it's a ripple effect. You know, it, it caused a lot of major changes in, in our society in North America um, and lots of people dealing with the aftermath, with the... Uh, firefighters and and so, so many so many tragedies and while all that was going on my Muslim family my Muslim community they're all very excited they're all very happy they're full of joy you know they feel like oh we're winning um, Islam is victorious we have you know you know they've terrorized New York City you know, and so they feel so proud that they were able to do this to the infidels. And it made me sick that I was part of a group of people who would feel happy and excited about this, even though I knew it, you know, of course I knew it. I knew that, you know, Assam was in Afghanistan. I knew the jihad was part of Islam. I knew all about the Mujahideen. I know, I know all of this stuff, but it's like, it's theory. There's a big difference between theory and then reality. So it's like a, so many people in my organization that you mentioned, Free Hearts, Free Minds. We have a lot of people contacting us from Syria and Iraq who say things like, when ISIS became a thing and we started to see how the, the reality of what it means to follow in the footsteps of the prophet, we were so disillusioned with Islam. We were so disgusted. And, we, and, and that's why a lot of people in those parts of the world 
denounced Islam because it's, you know, to actually see Yazidi women being taken as sex slaves. It's very different than just reading hadith about it or reading in the Quran when they're talking about, um, you know, what your right hand possesses and all that. So it, it's, it's real now. Now we're actually talking about taking girls and mothers as sex slaves. And, you know, Muslim people at the end of the day, they're human beings. <laughs> and even though they're indoctrinated and they're told to believe this and they're told to support this, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do that um, when you see the reality of it. And so that was what it was for me. That's what made me feel like I can't be a part of this anymore. One of the many reasons, you know, there's so many of them. But I think that was maybe the, the biggest sort of uh, catalyst. Uh, there, are, there are a bunch of reasons means um, I think that women should not follow Islam because beating wife is permissible. Um, in Sunan Ibn Majah, it says that uh, a person will not be asked on the day of judgment that why he beat his wife. There is no punishment for beating wife. And uh, even God forced uh, Prophet Ayub or Job that he should beat his wife. Uh, means, um, uh, wait, let me sh share that thing on screen. It's Quran, Surah Saad, chapter 38, verse 44. Uh, let me read it from Sahih International. We said uh, to Job, uh, means we said to Job, and take in your hand uh, a bunch of grass and strike uh, with it uh, and do not break your oath and there's a footnote let me click on the footnote and it says at the point during his illness job became angry with his wife and swore that if he recovered he would punish uh, her with 100 lashes according to allah's instruction instruction the oath was fulfilled by striking her uh, uh, once with 100 blades of grass so indeed, we found yeah. him pa patient, uh, pa patient, and uh, an excellent servant. Indeed, uh, he was one uh, rapidly turning back to Allah. So means when he beat his wife, uh, God is telling that he was an excellent servant. So mm. uh, in also Quran chapter uh, four verse thirty four, it is permissible to beat your wife, and there are so many uh, different verses. A woman uh, could not rule. Muhammad said in Bukhari Hadith 4425 and 7099 that never will succeed such a nation uh, which is ruled by a female or by a lady or by a woman. So, yeah, there's hey, so, you... so many examples of vicious, vicious misogyny. And another one of the hadith where his, uh, his wife, his child wife, his six year old bride, Aisha, when she said that nobody suffers like the Muslim women, their bruises are more green than this green dress that I'm wearing. You know, she's yes. talking about how they're always beating their wives and and then they tell you that Islam is the most feminist religion. Yeah, that hadith in Bukhari hadith 5825, uh, um, where Rifa, uh, uh, where Verifa wife uh, married Abdul Rahman bin Zubair and Abdul Rahman bin Zubair beat her and uh, um, she was wearing green clothes but her uh, spots uh, were darker than her green clothes and uh, there are so many things means you have half inheritance according to Quran chapter mm -hmm. 4 verse 11 um, men are allowed to have sex slaves uh, Quran chapter 4 verse 24 uh, men have superiority over women, Quran chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 228. So uh, I have actually memorized everything. So, And uh, women uh, uh, are not intelligent, uh, uh, means mm -hmm. um, that they are dumb according to Islam. Uh, they, will because, fill, uh, they will fill Jahannam. Their testimony is uh, half as compared to male. A testimony mm -hmm. and that's why Muhammad called them dumb and even according mm -hmm. to Quran their testimony is half uh, and most of uh, women uh, will be fuel of hellfire and most of the dwellers of uh, hell would be women um, according to several hadith of Bukhari um, if a man uh, 
invite her wife to have intercourse with her wife could not say no to her husband even if she's sitting on the lump of a uh, lump of a camel and uh, Muhammad said that if I would have uh, commanded uh, to prostrate to anyone apart from God I would have uh, uh, I would have told women that they should prostrate to their uh, husband so mm -hmm. they have uh, no rights uh, they have no rights they don't uh, they have nothing but still most of my time I spend uh, debating with uh, Muslims on my channel so, so many girls came to defend Islam that Muhammad was the best person Islam is the best religion yeah. it gives me all human rights I go to study I go to college I could uh, wear makeup hijab, hijab is my choice and all that and I have to face their silly arguments which are pretty yeah. dumb and pretty yeah. hard to solve yeah. yeah it's it's sad it's like uh, it's like a, a Stockholm syndrome, you know, they're, they're indoctrinated, they're brainwashed. But it, it's funny, because I was one of those people. And I'm, you know, you are one of those people. So you, you know what it's like to be in that um, state of just, it, for me, it's like the cost of thinking was too high, the risk was too much. Because if you start to question all of the misogyny in this religion, all of the violence in this religion, all of the homophobia in this religion, all of the vicious, horrible things in this religion. So what does that mean? You know, it means that you're going to be disowned by your family. It means that you're going to lose your community. It means you're not going to have any friends and you're not going to have any family. You're going to be all alone and they're going to want to kill you because leaving Islam the punishment is execution. So it, with all of these forces around you, it kind of restricts you from wanting to make that decision. You don't, you don't want to believe this truth. So when you're having these debates with these people, you're not debating with logic, you're debating with emotion, you're, de you're de not debating with their hearts or with their minds, you're debating with their hearts, you know, they don't want to they know two plus two is four. You know, when you show them the facts, they know that, but they don't want to accept it because it's too, um, it, the risk is too great. Then they're going to have to accept my whole life was a lie. Everything that I have suffered for, the re, you know, the re, I'm wearing this stupid hijab for all these years, losing my individuality, wasting my time mumbling into the carpet five times a day, wasting my my life being scared of some imaginary being in the sky. You know, it's it's like they're going to feel stupid. They're going to feel angry. Um, and so they would rather believe their lies because it's more. It's more familiar and it's more comforting. I remember uh, I remember a short incident when uh, when I when I was uh, really young and I uh, went to a uh, water park and I was uh, and I and I was swimming uh, in the swimming pool with my friends and I was playing uh, uh, with my friends uh, who and they all were males and the women of my family they were just watching means girls were watching us playing but they cannot uh, uh, um, play with us in the swimming pool because they just have to wear that hijab they cannot enjoy they could just watch us um, uh, <sighs> playing near beaches and uh, playing in the swimming pool so uh, I feel really depressed that um, uh, I was a Muslim back then but I feel really depressed that what uh, what type of religion I'm following means they cannot enjoy their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't enjoy your life for something as simple as a day on the beach. And then you also can't enjoy your life, like you can't choose the person that you want to marry. You get pushed into whatever marriage your family chooses for you. And then if he chooses to rape you, you have to accept it or the angels are going to curse you until morning. You know, if he chooses to beat you, you have to accept it because Allah gave him that right. It, it it's it's never ending. It's never ending for women. The the it's like 
you forget that you're even a human being. You have to stop even wanting anything. You have to stop even being upset about anything because there's no point. You're just... This and angels life. are watching our private life means they are watching that what husband husband and wife are doing and uh, um so yeah how gross uh, <laughs> yeah that's uh it's yeah. like they are watching a porno or something and uh, <laughs> they are cursing the woman uh, uh for what they didn't get and uh, there are uh, uh, means a pretty strange thing that uh, black stone is uh, black according to tarikh al-tabri that uh, women who used to have uh, menstruation they were touching it uh, women are not allowed to have um, uh, hair extensions if their hairs are falling muhammad cursed them and uh, uh, muhammad also said uh, that when a man performs a lot and there is nothing in front of him uh, uh, then his salat is severed or invalidated uh, by a black dog, by a woman, and by a donkey. So Abu Zar Ghaffari, yeah. who is one of the narrator, he said that what is the problem with the black dog? He asked the prophet, and the prophet replied, "Because black dogs are devils." And yeah. <laughs> but according to uh, some hadith, uh, uh, like in Sunan Ibn Majah, hadith three six nine. Uh, Muhammad said, cats do not invalidate the prayer. Mm -hmm. So a woman could invalidate the prayer, but a cat who is um, an animal, uh, he is uh, he or she, it is not invalidating your prayer. Means a woman mm -hmm. is worse than an animal. That is correct. We are in that hadith, he makes us equal to devils because he thinks that that's what a black dog is. <sighs> I'm laughing at the comment that somebody is Tauba Tauba. <laughs> yeah, I'm also uh, uh, common sense is saying, what are you saying? Uh, Yasmin, a renowned scholar in India says Islam is logical as two plus two equals to four. You say the opposite, la hawla wa la kuwata ya tawba tawba. So, he is la hul villa kuwata. Okay, so I guess uh, uh, he don't know Arabic, so that's why <laughs> he's just making a sarcastic comment. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I appreciate. Uh, Someone uh, said, okay, so there is a comment of. Uh, uh, where the uh, vibe is saying women defending Islam is like a lamp advocating a case for the butcher. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but still, uh, so many people advocate Islam, and it's really unfortunate. It means women cannot even apply perfume. It means Muhammad said that if uh, mm -hmm. women apply perfume and if she goes out, uh, then angel curses her, and Muhammad also cursed that woman. Hazrat Umar used to curse that woman who applied perfume on her body and goes out. Uh, and uh, even her voice, can... even her voice is considered aura. She's not even supposed to talk in public. She's supposed to be covered head to toe in black, not to be seen and not to be heard. And. Uh, in Jamia Tirmidhi, there is a hadith, uh, hadith uh, 1513, uh, where it is said uh, that uh, someone asked uh, the Prophet about Akhikha, means when a child is born. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asked about Akhikha ceremony. Uh, then the, the Prophet said uh, that uh, you should slaughter two sheep. Uh, for a boy, if a boy is born, you should uh, celebrate it by uh, slaughtering two sheep. But when a girl is born, you should uh, slaughter only one sheep mm -hmm. and then uh, celebrate it. So again, uh, uh, when a boy is born, there's a bigger celebration. Two uh, sheep are being slaughtered. So Islam uh, has, uh, I guess, no women rights. Muhammad used to sell of women and by weapons uh, means in Sirat ibn Hisham, Muhammad ordered Zayd al-Ansari, uh, Saad bin Zayd al-Ansari, that uh, he should take uh, women of Banu Kureza 
to Najd and he should sold them uh, so they can buy horses and weapons from that money. So. Yeah, women are the only value in women is as sex slaves. And you can see that when they talk about to go to heaven, what is their gift in heaven is to have these hur right these sex slave things that are not even human um but it's just like this perpetual virgin that's that's what women are to them it's just a thing a thing for them to have sex with that's all that's that's it uh let me show you how these uh it's really interesting uh i just uh i was just uh opening it and there it is it's a hadith of sunan ibn majah hadith um, 2014 narrated from mas bin jabal that the messenger of allah said no woman annoys her husband but his wife among the huris of paradise suffs do uh, say, uh, says uh, means do not annoy him may allah destroy you for he is just a temporary guest with you and soon he will leave you and join us. So, who's are the means that these uh, uh, virgin maids of paradise are watching us? Uh, in Tafsir ibn Kasir, it is said that uh, men will have intercourse with uh, 100 virgin girls uh, at a time in heaven, but for women, there is nothing. And in Tafsir al Qurtubi and some other commentaries, a man could have around 4,000. A man could have around 4,000 virgin uh, partners uh, and they will again become virgin once he take their virginity. There, there is so much, uh, what do you call it? There is so much shit actually. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Jamia Trimizi, uh, a martyr will immediately get the 72 um, whores in the paradise. But there is nothing for women. and. Uh, Someone asked that uh, RP asked, uh, post it, Imam asked her, why Western liberals support Islam? You know, that's a really good question. And that's the subtitle of my book is trying to examine that too. And it's something that is very frustrating. But it's really just simple mindedness. They just look at it like, Muslims have brown skin, therefore, if we oppose Islam, then we are being racist. That's how they look at it, because they have simple minds. And they're not understanding that, first of all, if you look at the scripture of Islam, if you look at the edicts, it is far worse than the edicts of Christianity, which they feel very comfortable criticizing Christianity all the time. But they're not comfortable criticizing edicts that are even worse than Christianity. You know, they'll get angry at Catholic people for being homophobic, but they won't say a word about the fact that 15 Muslim majority countries will execute people for being gay. You know, they don't, they don't see how this is, if you have values, if you have core values, and you know, if you want to speak up in support of those values and against things that are, defy those values, then you 100% definitely need to be speaking out against Islam, which is, as you have given us so many examples, it is clearly anti-woman, it is anti-freedom, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's so anti-liberalism, which is something it's so anti-Western values, you know, these are things that they, they don't even understand. Um, and I can't even give them the benefit of the doubt. I can't even say it's ignorance because honestly, ignorance is a choice. Islam is the second largest religion on the planet, second largest religion on the planet. So if you don't understand Islam or if you don't know anything about it, that's on you. That's your problem. So for those idiots who keep on acting like Islam is just some um, 
benign Eastern religion, you know, they think of it as something like Buddhism or something. It's just, or, or, you know, it's just about, uh, it's just about peace and love. You know, they don't understand what Islam is. And so they, they defend it because they're ignorant. Yes, uh, I, I guess the whole world is ignorant. In France, we see they are making cartoons of Muhammad, but making cartoons of Muhammad will not educate Muslims. You have to educate them using Quran and Hadith. They are not doing that. And if they deal Islam with uh, just making cartoons of Muhammad, uh, in future they will lose uh, with Islam. And because it's the fastest breeding religion, and that's why it's the fastest growing religion, so it could dominate in the future. So we have to educate uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters using Quran and Hadith. We have to educate them from their own scriptures. But uh, unfortunately, world is uh, not concerned, not focusing on that issue, and uh, it's really unfortunate that. Uh, we ex-Muslims are highly underrated, means the uh, world is not listening to us. If we, uh, ex try to, if we try to expose Islam using Quran and Hadith, they call us Islamophobes. Uh, and uh, uh, their propaganda is uh, really strong. And if we talk about racism, mm -hmm. I guess uh, Islam is the most racist religion, means you have to kill mm -hmm. the black dogs, uh, uh, Muhammad said the worst men on the face of this earth is a black uh, man and uh, he was one of the leaders of Khawarij uh, which Ali killed uh, at the time of battle of Nehrwan and Muhammad also said that a black man will destroy the Kaaba in Sunan Nasai Hadith 2904 and uh, Hajre Aswad became black that black stone became black when Sinners were touching it when women um, uh, having menstruation, they were touching it. Uh, and uh, Muslims, uh, according to one of the articles of BBC, uh, uh, it was published on Monday, 3rd September 2001, that uh, Muslims usually have monopoly uh, in the Middle East of slavery. Means mm -hmm. around there are 17 million slaves uh, uh, in in the Middle East. So they bring girls from poor countries uh, and they sometimes rape them. They make them work uh, uh, in their house, in their houses. They don't properly feed them. Islam says that uh, disbelievers are worse than cattle. Uh, they are the worst creatures. They are, they are, they are impure. They are not pure. Uh, God turns Jews, uh, some Jews into rats, uh, according to Bukhari. According to Quran, God turned Jews into swines and apes. Uh, so it is anti-Semitic. Uh, Muslim will fight with Jews and Jews will hide behind uh, mountains and stones. But these mountains and, and stones will speak that, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind us, come and kill him. So this religion is anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Satan is a black man, according to Sirat ibn Hisham, that uh, um, some companions of Muhammad asked that uh, how uh, well, how Shaitan looks like. So Muhammad, there was a black man with long flowing hairs, inflamed eyes, and dark uh, ruddy cheeks. Muhammad said that she, Satan looks like this man. So it's... Uh, Islam is the most racist religion, means uh, the sadha is haram um, for the uh, for the race of Muhammad, means for, um, means for Sayyid or Sadat, the sadha is haram. Muhammad said that uh, Khalifate will remain uh, in Quraysh uh, even if there are two people alive uh, uh, on this world. So this religion is a... Uh, is a racist religion but unfortunately if we criticize this religion we are racist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you were married uh, to a fundamentalist um, al-qaeda member how how was it means uh, and how did you escape that marriage 
Um, so when I was married to him, obviously he was very abusive. So from the first day, um, when he would beat me, if I tried to complain to my mother, she would tell me, this is his right. You are his property. You have to obey him. It's your fault if he beats you. Um, and I became like a shadow of my former self. I was completely dehumanized. The niqab really helps with dehumanizing you. It, it separates you from society. So I don't know if you can even imagine what it's like to wear this thing. It's like a sensory deprivation chamber, you know? You can't see properly, you can't hear properly. Nobody can see you. So you're like a ghost walking around people. Children are scared of you. Um, so you basically get completely separated from the rest of society. And that was really effective in making me feel completely diminished. <sighs> and then, of course, you're being beaten and you're being raped and um, stuck in the house. I'm not allowed to leave the house unless it's to go to a doctor's appointment or something important like that. He has taped paper on all of the windows. So just in case the curtain blows, then uh, nobody will see through the glass. It was a prison. You know, it was a, it was a physical and a mental prison. And if I didn't have my daughter to protect, then I, I never would have been able to get out. But he talked about taking my daughter to Egypt to get FGM performed on her, which is very, very common in Egypt. Close to 90% of women have had this done to them. And uh, once he started to talk about taking her to Egypt and doing that to her, I just was filled with such a, a strong, you know, desire to protect her. I didn't want somebody taking a razor to her genitals and slicing them. So that's when I decided I need to get out of this house. I need to get my daughter away from him. But I didn't move fast enough and I ended up getting pregnant again. And when I was pregnant, of course he would continue to beat me. And so one of those beatings, he kicked me down the stairs and then came to the bottom of the stairs and continued to kick me in my back as I was lying on the, on the floor. And he killed the baby. And so when I went to go for the DNC surgery, that's when they remove the baby because it didn't have a heartbeat. The nurse told me, you're going to need someone to help you with your daughter who's at home because you're going to be groggy from the general anesthetic. So you're going to need someone to help you for a couple of days until you start to feel better. So I told him I'm going to need a week to go stay at my mom's house for a week. Because I knew that escaping from my mom's house would be easier than escaping from his house. And so when I went to my mom's house, um, she got up the next morning to go to, to work because she was the uh, Islamic studies teacher at the Islamic school. And I went and I found a lawyer and I asked the lawyer for a restraining order, divorce, and for full custody of my daughter. And um, 
she did all of those things. It was, these are the days before Google, the days before cell phones, you know, it was, it was really risky, really difficult and really scary. But um, anyway, that's how that happened. And at the same time, I was still in contact with CSIS who are like the Canadian CIA. Um, because of course they were following him. And so when he realized, cause he was going to get his Canadian citizenship because he was married to me. But when he realized that I had done this, he just became enraged. He came to my mother's building and he's screaming in Arabic. Um, all of these threats. And in English, he's saying, give me back my wife. So it's like a possession, you know, he's angry that someone took his things from him. And it's a very long road. It's a very long, very difficult road. And I outline it in my book in detail. And that's really why I started my organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds, is because as difficult as it was for me to get away from him, to get away from my family, to start my life over again, I was in Canada. I could get student loans, you know. I had the support of my society. I didn't, I wasn't living in a country like Iran or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Egypt, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't in a in a Muslim society where the the people and the government and the law enforcement and everybody is going to be against me. I was living in a free secular country and I barely survived. And so I was thinking like how are these other women even how do they even have a chance? And it made me feel like I have the responsibility. I'm compelled to, to do anything that I can to help people who are in the same situation as I was in that they are losing their friends and their family and they're scared and they're alone. But of course, it's so much worse because they're living in a Muslim majority country. And even, you know, you're in India, it's not a Muslim majority country, but we have many clients from India because even though it's a Muslim minority, they're a very powerful minority and it's very scary for ex-Muslims in India. As you know, <laughs> there's a reason why you are changing your voice and not showing your face, you know? So... I'm very proud of my organization and the work that we do. And I feel like it's the most I can do now is just focus on helping other people and focus on the positive. There's no sense for me. I don't find any value in arguing about stupid things, arguing about whether Muhammad went on a flying fucking mule with the face of a woman you know, if he flew up to heaven and had a chit chat with some prophets, like it's just so stupid. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to argue with you about your religion that is so vile to me and so nonsensical. It's like a waste of my time. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to spend my energy helping people who have already seen the light, helping women who have already left Islam. Um, helping women who have already decided that they want to remove their hijab and they're dealing with the um, the consequences of that. And, you know, I have to say that a lot of the people that I work with are Muslims too. It's not only ex-Muslims. Muslims who want to have some freedom in their lives are so controlled that they can't even ask questions, they can't even have conversations with their Muslim friends or their Muslim family. And so they have to reach out to ex-Muslims just to be able to express themselves. 
you know, like Ramadan, I'm getting messages from Muslim people sending me messages saying, you know, what is the sense of this? How does this, how, how is this in any way spiritual or holy or, you know, rational? And they, they just, you know, they're choosing for themselves. Okay, I'm going to fast, but I'm going to drink water or um, I'm not going to fast every single day. I'm only going to fast on some days, but not on the weekend or whatever it is. Like Muslims as individuals, they want to be able to cherry pick and choose what parts of the religion they want to keep and what parts of the religion, like you mentioned, are too um, violent, are too anti-Semitic are too misogynist, are too racist, and they just want to throw these parts away. And maybe they want to just keep some parts. But Muslims don't let you do that. <laughs> they don't have um, um, they don't have this belief in independent thinking or in autonomy. It's a group. It's a ummah. You know, when my mother threatened to kill me, it was only because I removed my hijab and so you do anything a little bit different from what is demanded of you then immediately you're discarded immediately you're um, an infidel and so Islam really you know the Muslim people really need to relax and they need to allow people to make their own decisions and make their own choices about how they want to practice this religion and if they want to practice the religion at all because the way that they are so um stringent and so black and white that's what's making people run away because if you're going to demand that i do all of these things i don't like these things i like some of them but i don't like all of them but if you're going to demand that i do all of it or i'm not a muslim anymore okay halas. so i'm not muslim anymore Um, there are several myths um, regarding uh, Ramadan. Means uh, some uh, Muslims believe that uh, your reward, your reward for good deeds, is multiplied by seventy times, and your uh, and your punishment uh, for doing something evil is also multiplied by seventy times. That's mentioned nowhere in any hadith, and that's why they are fasting. They think that this month is holy because your reward is multiplied by seventy, which is not mentioned in any hadith. And uh, we have to spread this awareness. And uh, yeah, there's lots of things that they believe that is not anywhere in any hadith and is not anywhere in the Quran. Even the five pillars of Islam. Where did they get that from? That's not written anywhere even the most basic things, they just, they, most Muslims have never cracked open the Quran. Most Muslims have never read it. Most Muslims definitely have never even looked at a hadith. They just go to the Friday khutbah and they listen to the imam, tell them about how we're going to kill the Jews and how the rocks and the trees are going to talk to us and tell us that the Jews are hiding behind them. Or they talk about how we're going to kill the infidels and we're going to have our Ummah and our caliphate and our whatever, they just they just listen to whatever the imam tells them every Friday and then they go back to their life. They're not studying the religion themselves. If they looked at the religion, they would recognize immediately that it's bullshit. Exactly. Talking cows, talking cats, talking fox, uh, talking wolves, talking stones, talking, talking trees. Camps. Uh, crying yeah. tree at the time of Muhammad. There are so many dumb things which are pretty hard to swallow. Means uh, there is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari which says that when Muhammad uh, uh, went to see his Lord at the time of Isra al Miraj, uh, he saw two rivers flowing, uh, and he asked uh, the, that, "What are these two rivers?" Uh, Angel Gabriel, Gabriel uh, or Jibrail replied that. Uh, these two rivers are Nile and Euphrates. So it's uh, holy shit means two rivers uh, which are on our planet Earth. They are coming from the seventh sky, which is pretty hard to swallow. And it makes a uh, whole uh, journey of mirage uh, false uh, event uh, might be a result of hallucination. 
This is uh, from World Health Organization that FGM, female genital mutilation, it says that mm -hmm. uh, around 200 million girls and women alive today have undergone uh, FGM in 30 countries in Africa, the Middle East, uh, the Asia, where FGM is practiced. Um, it's a violation of human rights. Uh, it has no medical benefits. Uh, and uh, uh, just because of FGM, uh, uh, we have uh, people spend around 1.4 million USD dollar per year, per year, uh, which could uh, later rise to 2.3 billion um, US dollars by year 2047 because, for, because of the complications you have after FGM. It, and it has uh, no health benefit, only harm, and it has so many... Uh, uh, immediate complication and then uh, long-term complication and uh, it's really dangerous and there are several hadiths where fgm muhammad actually uh, said that uh, uh, fgm is permissible he said that when two circumcised part meets in muatama malik uh, hadith mm -hmm. 104 then ghusl or path is obligatory in Muatama Malik Hadith 105. In Tirmizi, it was also mentioned that Aisha said that when the circumcised uh, part meets the other circumcised part, then the ghusl is required. Uh, and she said, that is why I myself and Allah's apost uh, apostle uh, perform ghusl. So Aisha was also circumcised. The mm -hmm. uh, there was a woman uh, mentioned in Adab al Mufra, then uh, Sunan Abi Dawud Hadith uh, 5271. She used to perform circumcision of uh, women in Medina. And Muhammad said that do not cut uh, severely, as it is better for women and more desirable for husband. And in Maliki uh, sect, uh, in Maliki fiqh, it's permissible. Uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, he mentioned in his book uh, uh, Fatawa Nisa, Fatawas of the Muslim Women, he said that um, you have to circumcise women so they could control their sexual lust. I didn't get the mm -hmm. logic that uh, how it could control uh, their sexual lust, but he says that. Uh, and luckily, uh, you protect um, your family. Uh, uh, from this outcome and uh, in india there is a community daudi bohra they openly mm -hmm. perform fgm because it's not legal here in india and i'm trying to declare it illegal i'm to i'm talking with uh, uh, several politicians and um, i'm contacting so many people so, so many lawyers uh, that uh, we should take any action and make fgm illegal in india then we could see that how muslims will react uh, upon it and they will simply play the victim card they will protest they will play the card of um, that this country is becoming uh, islamophobe they hate the muslims um, they are persecuting us uh, um, and uh, they are actually persecuting hindus in india but uh, 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 but people don't know about me uh, that I'm an ex-Muslim. When they meet me personally, some people, especially who are living in the West or Muslims who are living in the West, they ask me, oh, brother, uh, you're from India. Um, how are you living? How you are still alive? Uh, we heard that they are persecuting Muslims. Uh, uh, they even eat babies, <laughs> Muslims. Oh they, I, I don't know what they... There are so much misinformation uh, in uh, in the West, uh, and uh, they have totally defame. Um, um, they have totally defame uh, India. Uh, common sense said it's so uh, inspirational to see women speak up. People uh, like you are the savior to humanity. I have been an admirer of uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali. Now you too are on the list. I appreciate, brother. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, someone says that uh, I think Dawdi Bohra community follow FGM. Yeah, um, I know so many uh, Dawdi Bohra uh, smiley friends, and they openly said to me that their wife and their daughters are circumcised. So mm -hmm. it's really unfortunate. Um, 
it's really amazing i hope that uh, again in the future you will uh, come and j join us uh, i was waiting for uh, past four months that you will come and join me uh, and uh, luckily you joined uh, uh, after four months i guess um, um, for, uh, it's actually f five months later <laughs> you joined I'm so, sorry it took so long, but it was worth the wait. I'm glad that we finally were able to meet. This was a, I would a love really to work discussion. with your organization if I somehow. Um, yeah, uh, I would love that. If I, if I somehow manage to escape, I would love to meet uh, meet you. I would love to join and work for your organization. I mean, that would be wonderful. So, Let's keep in touch. Yeah, well, we will stay in touch. Uh, we will keep in touch. And uh, any last words for our viewers? Uh, because before we end the stream, um, I will ask your viewers um, to please, since you're on YouTube, maybe go to my YouTube page, Forgotten Feminists, and listen to some stories from some other women who have survived similar stories to mine. I think it's important for us to celebrate these women that have accomplished these amazing things uh, like